Seeing this footage, you're immediately going to say, that's the North Pole. However, you have no idea that at least 751 explorers died in the first expeditions to this region before we even put it on the map. Now, imagine that in 1897, one daredevil had the guts to go there in a hydrogen balloon. His name was Solomon August Andre. My blood runs cold in my veins when I look at the grim photos made during his fateful expedition. I think they've made it clear that this particular North Pole exploration didn't go smoothly. The photos convey only a tiny part of the challenges Andre and his colleagues had to overcome just to survive in the region's harsh weather conditions and try to get back safely. Did they succeed? Keep watching to find out. As always, viewer discretion is advised. Before 1909, when an American named Robert Perry reached the North Pole for the first time, people regarded this area of the planet as almost this mystical place and could only fantasize about what it looked like. For instance, a group called the Hollow Earthers thought that the North Pole concealed a hole leading into a heaven-like world. Perry was the first person to see ice mountains, glaciers, and icebergs of the pole. Yet the only way of getting there were by a sled or on foot. So many geologists and cartographers died while exploring in the harsh weather conditions. Then, a Swedish engineer named Solomon August Andre had the idea of finding another way of reaching the North Pole that would be less exhausting and deadly. He decided to go there in a hydrogen balloon. According to Andre, this was the perfect plan since he'd calculated that the journey to the pole would take him less than 60 hours. There, the explorer would be able to take the first aerial photos of this region and joked that, in the end, he'd land in San Francisco. The scientific community was skeptical about the plan, as hot air and hydrogen balloons can only move in the direction of the wind, making them unfit for such a complicated journey. Yet Andre equipped the balloon with a sail and a special system of heavy ropes. His inspiration for it was the guide rope, invented by a British balloonist, Charles Green. It was a type of braking rope that hung off the balloon and kept it at a set altitude due to its weight. When dragged across the ground, it slowed the balloon down, enabling Andre to control its movement. This idea was welcomed with patriotic fervor, as Sweden was very far behind in the North Pole exploration race between countries. The expedition turned into a real show with Solomon Andre as its main star. It was even advertised in newspapers to help the explorers find sponsors willing to contribute to a fundraising effort with a goal of no less than 130,000 krona. Today, this would amount to approximately 1 million US dollars. Eventually, Solomon got supported by the former head of the Swedish expedition to Spitsbergen, Dr. Nils Ekholm, Baron Oscar Dixon, and the dynamite inventor himself, Alfred Nobel. On May 31, 1896, after over a year of preparation, Andre and his team went to Danes Island in Spitsbergen. There, they spent six weeks at a frontier base waiting for favorable weather conditions. Newspaper headlines detailed every step of the preparation and kept writing about the brave and industrious explorer bound to set out for the North Pole. Finally, the moment arrived. The team started inflating the balloon. To make the balloon's surface leak-proof, silk was folded twice and coated with lacquer on both sides. Although no balloon had lasted in the air for longer than 36 hours before, Andre claimed this one could stay afloat for an entire month. Yet he soon saw gas leaking out of it even before it was fully inflated. The final disappointment was that the necessary wind and weather conditions never arrived despite the optimistic forecasts. That's why on August 17th, the balloon was deflated and the expedition members returned to Stockholm. Andre was devastated. In just a moment, he went from being a national hero to a laughingstock, a fraud, and a popularity seeker. Andre plunged into despair, but only for a few months. In the spring of 1897, Solomon decided to repeat his attempt, all the more so that Alfred Nobel was ready to provide him with financial support again. This time, the Swedish government made sure the explorer was accompanied by a team of professionals, a construction engineer with considerable experience working in the Arctic, Knut Frankel, and the intellectual Neil Strindby who developed a reflection camera in a hermetically sealed case specifically for this trip. However, that wasn't the only reason he was accepted on the team. The young man was rather good looking and, back in the day, society regarded scientists as we do rock stars today. So the presence of handsome Niels won many female admirers for the second iteration of the expedition. The main envelope of the air balloon was called the Eagle and had a height of 30 meters and a diameter of 21 meters. 
Andre took utmost care to prevent the repetition of his past gas leak fiasco. So once ready, the envelope was given an additional coat of lacquer inside and out. After this, it weighed no less than a ton and a half. The Eagle looked nothing like today's hot air balloons, which are only used to entertain tourists. In this one, the basket had two floors. The top floor accommodated a two and a half meter viewing platform and the lower compartment held mattresses, reindeer skin sleeping bags, and a small photo lab. Andre wanted to develop photos on the way and immediately send them back to Sweden via 36 homing pigeons. In this way, the explorer ensured that the valuable materials from the North Pole expedition would make it to the civilized world even if the expedition itself didn't come back, as if he already felt something was gonna go wrong. If you can't wrap your mind around how a lab, birds, and an entire team of people managed to fit into the basket, I'll add that this is far from being the exhaustive list of what Andre brought with him. The basket was packed with navigation devices, maps, books, weapons, and food that would last for three and a half months. Thus, the overall weight of the provision reached 767 kilograms, consisting, among other things, of 200 liters of water a few boxes of champagne and beer from the sponsors, and even two bottles of port wine, a gift from the King of Sweden himself. It was as if Solomon, Niels, and Canute were setting out on some kind of tour or party. The inventive Andre also built a sled that folded into two parts, and a canvas boat that could be disassembled. So, apart from a lab, bedroom, a dining room, and a bar, Andre managed to fit a garage on board a balloon. Yet despite his attention to detail, the balloon had one dangerous flaw it still wasn't leak-proof. The explorer tried to stop leaks by putting another coat of lacquer on the seams, but to no avail. Because of this problem, the balloon could be losing load capacity of 45 kilograms every 24 hours of the journey, dipping lower and lower. That's why Andre was advised to postpone the expedition, but the engineer replied that he didn't dare delay the flight yet again. On July 11th, 1897, the three brave men took their places in the balloon's basket. Assistants started cutting off the ropes. One of them cut his finger and shouted, hell, upon seeing blood. Andre said pensively, hell, that is where we are going. Almost at the very beginning of the flight, Andre's guide rope system pulled the eagle so low that the basket plunged into the water. Later though, friction made most of the ropes twitch. They detached from their screw holes, causing the balloon to go up. However, the three explorers didn't notice it right away since at the moment, they were throwing out sand ballast to raise the basket over the water and stop the flooding. Thus, in the first few minutes, the balloon lost 740 kilograms of weight and ascended much higher than necessary. At an altitude of 700 meters, the lower air pressure forced the hydrogen to escape through the 8 million sewing holes in the envelope. At that moment, Andre faced a dilemma, either to land the balloon before it was too late or to take a deadly risk. Realizing that he stood no chance of receiving funding and people's trust for the third time, he and his team just flew on, carried by the wind. From the beginning of the flight, two days and three and a half hours passed. At no moment were the expedition members able to sleep for even a little while. As much as Andre had hoped he'd somehow regain control over the balloon, a calm flight only went on for 10 hours, 29 minutes. And for the remaining 41 hours, the men had to endure a horrible shaking. The balloon would often descend and hit the ground until it crashed completely on July 14th. In this photo by Strindby, we can see Andre and Frankel wistfully staring at the fallen eagle. Neither the men nor the homing pigeons were hurt. Even the fragile optical equipment remained intact, but none of this mattered since at the time of the crash, the explorers had only reached a third of the total distance to the North Pole. Now, the three adventurers only had one task, to survive and return home. But using a sled and on the constantly drifting ice, the only thought that brought joy to the men was that they did manage to become the first, the first people to reach maybe not the North Pole, but the Arctic Circle on a hydrogen balloon. Still, there were hardly any reasons to celebrate. Soon, the explorers began freezing since they were wearing ordinary wool coats without fur. Luckily, they had some oil skin, which they wrapped themselves in. It's a waterproof fabric used for sailors' clothes. Before setting out on their way, the three men spent a week in a tent at the crash site, packing for the trip. Andre got the sled ready to go, but after pushing it for just a little bit, the engineer had a terrifying realization. In prioritizing the sled's compactness, he had neglected its practicality. It was almost impossible to use it for transportation in the complex terrain of the Arctic. 
with its ravines, icicles, and steep hills. Apart from that, the explorers had loaded every sled with over 200 kilograms. The sleds themselves were also rather heavy. Then, the men were forced to throw out even more provisions, or at any given minute, the sled could break the ice, and they would die in the freezing water. It was also essential to make the right decisions of what route would bring them home in a safer and faster way. The choice lay between the two deposits of food and ammunition the men had created beforehand, precisely for this scenario. They put the first one in the Seven Islands, Spitsbergen, and the other one on Cape Flora, Franz Josef Land. The distances to both of these points were approximately the same, and the travelers decided to reach the larger deposit on the Cape. Back then, they couldn't have fathomed that it was a mistake. The maps were a bit imprecise, and the option they picked was actually farther away. Unaware of this, the trio set out on their path. Since the explorers had thrown out most of their food, they had to risk their lives and hunt large arctic animals. They shot seals, walruses, and even the stocky polar bears. The situation got further aggravated on July 22nd, eight days after the crash, when the travelers found out that the ice was drifting in the opposite direction, which meant that they'd been moving from their deposit and not toward it the whole time. On August 4th, after a long discussion, they decided to go in the southwestern direction to the Seven Islands hoping to use the current to reach them in six to seven weeks. Yet on September 12th, the explorers accepted the fact that they'd have to winter on the ice. Strindai came up with a way of building sturdy huts by reinforcing snow walls with cold water. The travelers set up camp on a big drifting ice floe, allowing it to carry them along the current. The wind was pushing it southward to the island of Kavitoya. Yet on October 2nd, the ice floe got pushed against the island and started crumbling right under the hut. So, the men had to spend several days carrying the remaining supplies to Kavitoya. Despite these challenges, the team's spirits were up. Andre was thanking his fate for Niels and Knut as his companions in these hard trials. He believed that with friends like these two, one could overcome anything. Five days later, they finished carrying their stock to the island and were incredibly happy to finally feel the ground under their feet. However, after the men made landfall, their traces disappeared, and no one heard anything else from the three explorers. So, is it possible that Andre had been right, and they ended up in hell? Hold on, you're probably confused by such a sudden ending, and of course, you don't understand how come we know so many details of this deadly trip if all its participants went missing. It feels fine to be able to sleep here on fast land as a contrast with the drifting ice out upon the ocean where we constantly heard the cracking, grinding, and din. We shall have to gather driftwood and bones of whales, and we'll have to do some moving around when the weather permits. October 8th, 1897. This was the last entry in the journal Andre had been keeping that entire time. Every detail of the failed expedition, the photos, the traveler's route, their coordinates, and even their emotions and feelings were successfully retrieved in part with the help of this manuscript. Frankel's meteorological journal and Strindberg's film from which almost 200 photos were developed. While the explorers were fighting for survival in the harsh conditions of the Arctic Circle, no one in their homeland knew what they were going through. Andre released almost four pigeons at the very beginning of the journey, but only one of them was found. The sailors aboard a Norwegian steamboat the bird perched on shot it immediately to obtain the message before it flew away. It was dated July 13th. In the note, Andre wrote their coordinates and said the weather was good and they were doing well. Yet months and then years went by after that message. The disappearance of three adventurers became one of the biggest mysteries of the Arctic exploration. Only after 33 long years, in 1930, a Norwegian explorer boat found the remains of the deceased travelers, as well as their belongings, including their diaries. For example, on the day when the overloaded sled started sinking under the ice. Niels wrote in his diary to his beloved Anna Charlier, about how distressed he was over a bag with her letters and portraits that had gotten wet due to the adventurer's carelessness. Well, what are you going to think this winter? That's my only concern, Niels worried. Meanwhile, Anna spent 13 long years clinging to the hope of her beloved returning home before she finally married someone else. Yet, where are the answers to the most important questions? Why did the three of them die? And how come nothing's written about it in the journal? Andre rejoicing over their successful arrival at the island was actually not the last entry in the journal. It's just that the remaining pages are covered with mold, which makes them impossible to read. A few doctors and historians have examined the existing entries, especially the parts concerning the three explorers' physical well-being and the food they consumed. 
This revealed that the men ate giant servings of half-cooked meat of wild animals. In their diaries, the explorers often complained about sore legs and diarrhea. After September 10th, the entries in Andre's journal, which used to be daily, became less frequent, and his handwriting deteriorated. Taking into consideration everything mentioned above, a doctor named Ernst Trude wrote a whole book about the three daredevils, Dead on Kvitoya, in which he stated that they'd most likely died of trichinosis. It's a parasitic disease caused by a roundworm called trichinella. It infests people who consume raw or insufficiently cooked meat. The symptoms are more or less like the ones described by the explorers, although Andre was most scared of a shameful defeat. In Sweden, he's to this day touted as a hero who, despite not reaching the North Pole, risked his life for a crazy idea. If you think that in our times, with our modern technology and safe transportation, we as humans have managed to explore all regions of the Earth, you're wrong. And no, I'm not going to repeat trite phrases about the still unexplored world of the oceans. I'm talking about areas of Gangkar Puensum, Kamchatka, Greenland, rainy Amazon forest, and the deserts Sahara and Namib. In the comments, write about expeditions you'd like to find out about in the next video, and subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss it.